You know, this is a really special day, actually in a couple different ways. Obviously, you know, it's a special day because we're celebrating what God has done miraculously with this building. And I don't use that word miraculous lightly. There were several times in this process of purchasing and then renovating this building where God did what seemed like it was impossible to do multiple times. So we're very grateful for that. But I'm sure that you understand that the, the church isn't the building. This is just where the church meets. The church is the gathered body of believers. And that's the second thing that makes this day so special. And it's the more significant part. It's you. It's all of you. See, and it's the opportunity that we have this morning to basically say, look at what God's doing here and to invite you to be a part of it. And that really is a big part of the reason we're doing a grand opening. We're not just celebrating what God already did, but we're inviting you into what he's doing now and what he's going to do, what we believe that he's, that he's going to do. So um, I know probably many of you already have a church home and you're just here to celebrate with us and to support us and, and that's great. I thank you for coming out and showing your love and support that way. Uh, it means a lot to us. Um, but you know, for those of you who are maybe considering renovate as your church home, uh, we want to help you get to know us. You know, what is our culture like? What do we value and stuff like that? So that's why we included some of the uh, materials we did in your gift bags. Uh, there's a lot of, we worked very hard to try our best to communicate who we are, what we value so that if you are searching for a church home, you can evaluate that. And um, I really prepared this message around that thought too. So in that sense, uh, this is a little bit of an atypical message, uh, but you can always go to our website if you're interested in finding out how we, uh, how we teach and stuff like that. You can go to our website, got lots of messages there. We have been meeting as a launch team on, on Saturday nights and just kind of tweaking things, getting it ready for this day. And um, so we believe in expository teaching. Uh, we just finished a book in, uh, or a study in the book of Acts where we went kind of verse by verse through the book. Um, but we also believe in topical teaching which means basically we look at the whole council of scripture around a specific topic. And the reason we do that is, and we believe that both are valid, both are valid teaching methods. Um, and we do that because our, our theology is extremely practical at Renovate. It's extremely pra practical. We want to, uh, we want you to get to know God not just get to know about God, but to actually know him. So that's why we do what we do. Um, we consider knowing God the most important thing we can do. Uh, one time Jesus was asked, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So if loving God is the, is the greatest commandment, then you can see why it's important for us to know him. Because you can't love someone this way, the way this passage describes. You can't love someone that way unless you know them. So our aim in our theology is to know God, not just know about him. Uh, but, you know, in this passage, Jesus didn't stop there. Uh, he said, loving God is the first and greatest commandment, but then he continued, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So this is the foundation that 
uh, we are building renovate on, that God is building renovate on, it's love. It's what drives everything we do, at least in theory, because we're people and we're, you know, we're not very good at doing the things we're supposed to do. But in theory, this is, this is what drives everything we do. Because it's, it's really easy for churches to become about other things, even other good things. But see, if you don't have love, none of that works. You say, well, Greg, what about worship? But weren't we created for the purpose of worship? Well, yeah, but if you love God, you're naturally going to worship him, right? You say, well, what about the Great Commission? You know, go into all the world and make disciples. Well, if you love your neighbor, if you love other people, you're going to go. You see that? It's like all of these other things flow out of love. So that's our foundation. All the law and all the prophets hang on love. Now, whenever I mention love, if, you're, if you've been around for a, a while, if you're part of our launch team or whatever, you know, every time I talk about love, I have to kind of define it a little bit. You see, because biblical love is not about feeling. In our culture, if you Google right now the, the definition of love, it's going to say feelings. It's what you feel. It's a strong feeling, blah, blah, blah. But see, biblical love is what you do. And, you know, that's true in the context of loving God. And it's true in the context of loving each other. Concerning loving God, 1 John says, this is love for God to keep his commandments. Hmm. See, God's love for us was more than just a feeling, wasn't he? It actually cost him something substantial. That's what the cross stands for. The cost of loving us. And real love for God costs us something. That's what this passage is about. And love for each other is more than just feelings. It's sacrificing for the well-being of, of others. It's giving. It's, it's serving. It's listening to someone. It's, you know, the scripture says, putting others' needs above our own. That's what love is for other people. And you know what? That kind of love is the foundation of every good and healthy relationship. Don't you want to be a part of a community like that? That's what we're doing our best to build, renovate on. Now, it is possible um, that some of you may not see the value of actually being a committed part of the church. I'm not just talking about attending twice a month or whatever, even every week. Or maybe you have been a committed part of the church and you, you know, maybe you're disillusioned because of the experience with flawed people or flawed systems, flawed leadership or whatever. But listen to me, if you're turned off to church involvement for whatever reason, let me challenge you with this. Jesus said, I will build my church, Steve Logan, one of our first meetings, he, Steve quoted this verse, verse to me. He said, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. I think about that often. I think about that passage often. So we just spent 10 weeks examining the beginnings of the church and how it formed. And I can tell you beyond the shadow of a, of a doubt, Jesus built the church. Jesus built the church. And you know what? He did not set up a plan B. The church is the body of Christ. So if you are a believer, you're part of the body of Christ. If you're a believer and you're not engaged in the church, 
That's like a human body that's missing a hand or a foot or something. <laughs> so if you're not currently involved in the church, can I just invite you to do two things? Two very simple things. First of all, pray about that. See what God has to say about it. Because listen to me, if God is the smartest being in the universe. Can we all agree on that? And he knows everything. He knows everything. And since he loves you and he wants what's best for you, don't you want to know what he thinks about this subject, church involvement? Don't you want to know? So I just encourage you, pray about that and see what the word of God has to say about it. And then act. Secondly, I want to challenge you concerning this topic to actually choose what you're going to do about that. That's the second thing I want to talk about is choices. I know it sounds kind of weird to go actually choose, you know, but the truth is much of what we do in life isn't a result of conscious decisions that we make. It's actually based on more of an unrealized feeling that we have about things, you know? And many times we're not even aware of why we have that feeling. And even when we are aware of why we feel the way we do, we often don't purposely choose what we're going to do about that thing. It's really more of just a, you know, oh, I'm gonna be led by my heart, right? Isn't that what we're taught? Follow your heart. How many times do you hear that? But see, the issue with that is, Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Wow. So the problem that we face all the time when we make choices, whether they're big ones or small ones, the challenge we face is that there's all this stuff going on in our heart and it's, our heart is deceitful and we don't even understand what's going on in there. This is true. Maybe some of you are aware of it. Maybe you're going, well, that's the first time I've heard that. Now, thankfully, the book of Proverbs chapter four has some really great instruction about this topic. That chapter is all about uh, getting wisdom no matter what it costs. Get wisdom at any cost. It's about choosing to embrace um, good advice and then kind of relentlessly following that good advice. I don't have time to read the whole chapter, chapter four of Proverbs, but I would encourage you to read that with what we're talking about in mind. Uh, but I do... I do think it's important for us to understand this principle. So I'm just going to read a few verses out of this chapter. First of all, notice that the, the author uses a metaphor of kind of following and traveling on this pathway. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn away from it and go on your way. And then in verse 18, the path of the righteous, the path of the righteous is like the morning sun shining ever brighter till the full light of day. So there's a picture of two distinct paths and a strong challenge throughout the entire chapter to follow the right one, to choose to follow the right one. Then notice uh, that the author addresses the same thing that Jeremiah did in that passage that we just looked at from his book, um, the issue of the heart. So a few verses later in verse 23, above all else, guard your heart for everything else flows from it. Everything flows from the heart. And the word heart here, uh, it's the exact same word that Jeremiah used in the Hebrew. They're, they're referring to the same thing. And then he says, 
above all else in order to emphasize how important this principle is. So let's take a minute to kind of unpack this. First of all, um, if it's important for us to guard our heart, then it's pretty important that we know what the heart is, right? What, what are they talking about, the heart? Well, see, in biblical terms, the heart is the center of who we are. I really like how Dallas Willard defines it. The human heart is the executive center of a human life. The heart is where decisions and choices are made for the whole person. That is its function. So when Solomon warns us to guard our heart, he's warning us to guard the part of us that makes choices. Because he understands what Jeremiah was talking about, that our heart is deceitful. See, the world says, follow your heart. But God says, your heart is deceitful. Follow me. Follow me. He says, guard your heart above all things. Why is this so important? So I'm going to try to um, illustrate this graphically. Stick with me. Bear with me. You can come to some conclusions um, that aren't intended if you don't wait till the end. So wait to hear this whole thing. <laughs> Stick with me, okay? All right. This line represents our path in life. And that's us kind of trudging along the path. You know, we're faced, like I said, with decisions all the time. Big ones like, who am I going to marry? Where am I going to go to college? You know, what vocation am I going to pursue? What church am I going to go to? Am I even going to go to church? Those are big decisions. They don't happen every day. But you know, our little decisions really affect our big decisions. Every minute of every day, we make what I like to call micro choices. Micro choices. And they're very subtle. And oftentimes, we probably don't even think of them as choices. Uh, for example, you know, maybe you're at work and someone says to you, oh, you look different. I'm trying to pick something benign to make an illustration. Hopefully that's benign for you. <laughs> maybe not. Um, oh, you look different. So that information enters into our heart through our ears it enters into our heart, and at that point, we begin to process it, and we actually begin to make micro choices about that comment. Was that an insult? Or was that just a neutral comment? You know, we don't even realize that we're making choices about that person, about that situation, and even about ourselves. And then maybe at some point you think, that person has been pretty snarky to me lately. I think that was an insult. <laughs> they just called me ugly. <laughs> or something, you know. <laughs> well, see, at that moment, something happens. That choice changes our trajectory. In, in this case, you know, it affects how we feel about that person. It will affect how we act to that person. It actually changes our trajectory. Now, this is a micro choice. So it only changes our trajectory a little bit, probably much less than what I've illustrated here. Um, but I just want you, I'm trying to make a point. So it's easy to see how big choices change our trajectory, right? Maybe we make a left turn or a right turn. Maybe we make a 180, which sometimes we need to do. And not all micro choices are bad choices. Some of them are really good choices. They bring us close to where we should be. But see, in the short term, it's really hard to see how these micro choices affect our trajectory. But over time, uh, it becomes clearer. See, we can see that something that was at first only kind of an ankle high difference and ends up being like way over our head. Now think about this line 
going off into eternity. See, the difference between our original path and this new path becomes potentially infinite, right? So the point I'm trying to make with this, it's actually pretty simple. I could have probably just said this, but it's me, you know. My point here is that even very small choices can result in very big differences. Maybe you've heard of the butterfly effect. This is part of uh, chaos theory that says that um, a butterfly can flap its wings in one part of the country and then several weeks later in another part of the country it can result in a tornado. I know that's, it sounds like unrealistic, but actually it's based on really solid science. You can Google it. You want me to do that right now? Um, it's the same with the human heart. Micro choices can result in huge differences and maybe in a direction that you don't want to go. And remember, we're making choices all the time. Big ones, little ones, medium ones. It results in, you know, But you know what, the, the most important ones are the ones we make about God. What micro choices have you made about God? You're doing that right now. And you probably don't even know it. You're making micro, micro choices about church, about God, about me, about each other. But what micro choices have you made about God? Who is he? What is he like? Is he good? Does he even exist? See, we do that way more than we realize. And the impact of that is incalculable. Everything you do flows from it. Everything you do flows from those choices in your heart. See, what our heart chooses, it, it, it informs what we do. And what we do leads us into the future that we'll have. That's pretty scary stuff, isn't it? Okay, now that I've completely terrified you with these thoughts, let me bring some comfort to this chaos. This is the part I was saying, wait for this part <laughs> before you judge what I'm saying. So this whole idea of how our choices impact our life, um, it actually can seem like an incredible amount of pressure on us and on, on our ability to make choices, right? Doesn't it? But is it really that precarious? Yes and no. See, if we take all this at face value, it would cripple your ability to make any decisions, wouldn't it? But see, God's not cruel like that, you know. You can actually rest in the sovereignty of God if your heart is yielded to him. If it's not, then it is pretty precarious. But if you're yielded to God, he takes care of everything else. I've been, I've been thinking an awful lot about this whole micro choices thing lately, sitting up at night thinking about it. And you know what, but I'm at total peace. I'm at total peace with this. You know why? Because I know that there's really only one choice that really matters. There's one choice that trumps every other choice that you can make. It's the choice to say yes to Jesus. That's what really matters. That's the one that changes your trajectory forever in the best possible direction. 
You know, every time I do this, I got this, you know, I'll be driving down the road. Ooh, that was a micro choice. You know, every time I do that, you know what I do? And it just, it just, it's like worship for me. It just blesses me. I just whisper under my breath, God, I choose you. God, I choose you. See, that's what really matters. You don't have to manage the chaos of life and all the billions of possible outcomes of our choices. The only choice you really need to be concerned with is the one that says, God, I choose you. And he'll take care of everything else. In fact, he already did. (laughs) He already took care of it. See, Jesus absorbed all of our bad choices into himself. You say, well, what about all those micro choices in that direction? And the, what about all that? Well, I'm not saying that that doesn't matter because it actually does. For example, if you leave here and go rob a bank, even if you're a believer, your trajectory is going to have some serious problems. But the beauty of this whole thing is it's not a fixed line like I illustrated. At any point, you can turn, you can change, you can say yes to Jesus at any point. See, for me, I think my line looks actually more like this. (laughs) Can anyone relate or is it just me? (laughs) Oh yeah, I got a big amen there. But you know what the Bible says about this? That's me being excited. (laughs) I didn't get bit by anything. Um, Scripture says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not unto your own understandings, but in all your ways submit to him and he will make your path Straight. Isn't that beautiful? Trust in the Lord. What does that mean, trust in the Lord? How do we trust in the Lord? It's more than just a feeling. It's more than just a thought. See, trusting in the Lord is believing that God loves you and he wants what's best for you. And you believe it so much that you follow him, that you say yes to him, that you do what he says to do. Not as a rule, not as a, you're not earning anything. That never works. You can't earn this, okay? But grace is opposed to earning, not to effort. It's okay to put a little effort in. None of us do that perfectly, by the way. None of us do. But it's okay to try. That's, that's not works righteousness. It's love for God. Remember what it said in 1 John? This is love for God to keep his commands. It's not the law. It's not rules. It's going, I trust you, God, so I'm going to do what you say. And you know the best way to do that? is in a community of people that share that value. That's why we started Renovate. It's not that there's not a million other churches out there doing that, but God told us to do this and we did it. This is a safe place to heal from bad choices. And you know what? We will love you in the midst of that as best we can. And together we will love God with our actions as best we can. By his, by his grace, that's, that's the kind of love we're experiencing. So if you're not currently involved in a church Please choose to change that trajectory. It's very important. 
Scripture says, so God says, do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together. Do you trust him with that? It's more than gathering, though. Again, just read about this for yourself. But engage in a church somewhere, even if it's not this one. It's okay. Just engage. Be the body of Christ. But I highly recommend this one. <laughs> it's pretty great. By the way, you know, I would just, we're going to dismiss in a minute, and I would just encourage you to talk to some of the people that have been part of this experiment that we're doing. I call it an experiment because if you become a part, you'll see it, it is kind of different what we do. It's not comfortable. It's not, it's not comfortable to have other people up in your chili. And I don't mean that in a weird way. It's just we get together every week, and after the service, we go have a meal together and we talk. And you would be surprised what people will share. <laughs> but we're just out there. Why? Because they know we love them. They know that this is a safe place for that. So talk to some of the people who have been a part of this and see what their experience is. They're all wearing name tags. Put your name tags on. <laughs> and so you can identify them easier, you know, maybe attend a few more services, a normal, a normal service, if there is such a thing here. Uh, attend a normal service, see what, see what it's like. And, um, but you know what? Land somewhere. Commit somewhere if you're not already doing that. Because that's God's plan for humanity, and there is no plan B.